something about it was very appealing that that kind of humor in in such a focused format i just could not wait every month to get that that magazine mm -hmm. read every word of every issue mm -hmm. But so why do you call the Kurtzman Mad, which lasted for a f few years, before the ph phenomenally long, and I mean phenomenal to mean that it was a phenomenon and not yeah, wonderful, yeah. the, the long run of Mad under Feldstein that was a phenomenon. Why do you call the Kurtzman the real one then? What distinction well, are you making? Once, you, once you've seen those Kurtzman issues, I mean, those are, those are probably the best comics ever made. Hmm. And... You know, the later stuff is just seems sort of corporate. It seems sort of like you know the the bland, corporatized version of mm. the Kurtzman stuff. Mm. But I, you know, I, th you'd see little glimpses of the Kurtzman stuff when I was a kid. You'd see like the Mad Reader had a cover that was sort of in that Kurtzman style, and mm. it was uh, it was just this kind of tantalizing thing of like, what you know, how can I ever see this? But mm. that was in an age where you'd never ever be able to see old stuff like that you just sort of waited till you know it was reprinted or something happened but you'd never be able to click a button and there it is you know oh there it is now i know all about it hmm. uh well, and we're going to see a sign well, well actually before this why is don't some, we, an is, early masterpiece this? yeah this was this was my attempt at doing mad magazine style parodies when i was about i think i was about 10 and uh this was a parody of the chicago tv show bozo's circus and uh, you can see my humor's in full force with the the clown who takes his giant shoe off and he has a bare foot with stink lines coming out of it. Um, and, this, you know, I, and actually I have no idea why I ripped that panel out. I guess I didn't know about correction fluid. <laughs> <laughs> then why do you still have this? How do you still have this? Did your parents save it? Did you save it? Why, why, is, it, why is this indoor? And survive. I somehow saved saved everything. Hmm. I don't know. I have no idea why. For a, an event like this in your mind? I knew. I knew one day I'd be sitting here next to you <laughs> and go, I've got to have something from that era. <laughs> okay. So here's the, ah. the sad reality of my career is that I never worked for Mad. I worked for Cracked. Does everybody know what Cracked is? It's, it, no, cracked, cracked, cracked is now cracked. a website that's actually sort of popular. Okay, so did you submit? Did you submit to Mad, or did you, did you just go right for Cracked? I I had a roommate in college who answered a want ad in the paper for like an assistant at Cracked, and within ten days he was the editor in chief of the magazine, <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got work for Cracked. <laughs> um, so Cracked, as we know, is. It's not mad. It's the <laughs> it's second very not rate mad. mad wannabe. Yeah. And when I think of you doing that, I can't help but think, be reminded of the fact that comics, as they're perceived in a larger culture, are the kind of the cracked of the literary world. They're the, <laughs> you know, they're right. the second rate like literary wannabe. You know. Right. Is is there something to that second tier wannabe status? Tell me what that status kind of confers. Is there kind of a comfort in that status of being the crack guy or being the comic guy and not being the great novelist? Or is there a kind of freedom in that? Or am I... I think I've always related to that, that kind of the second place guy because growing up in Chicago, especially in the 60s and 70s, you were constantly reminded that you're not New York and that mm. you're the second city and mm. too bad you finished second to the Mets in 1969 <laughs> and we're never stopped being reminded of that and so I I sort of embraced that after a while I'm like yeah Chicago and uh, and cracked with cracked is the Chicago mm -hmm. to New York's mad you know and mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I got a kind of a sick mm -hmm. thrill out of working for cracked and I was sort of disdainful of mad you know that well if they won't have me mm. I will just go to Cracked. <laughs> Did you ever have aspirations of working in an other art, an, another art form? Did you ever think of doing painting or fiction, you know, uh, text only? I wanted fiction. to do interpretive dance. To interpretive time. dance. <laughs> <laughs> hurt, <laughs> hurt my arches. Uh -huh. All right. So we'll pause now. We'll see some interpretive dance. <laughs> yeah. uh, here's Cracked. That's, to me, this... I love that I'm so old that I was in a magazine with that cover. 
and that like Back to the Future was in the theater. That's I mean <laughs> probably all these kids. That's uh, before they were born. <laughs> a Lloyd Llewellyn. Wow, fan. we've got one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there you are. There you are. No, it's not it's fair. Not, not true at all. A uh, big jump from crack to Lloyd Llewellyn. What happened not kind of so chronologically? Big. No, why not? I was uh, that was at the time I was working for Cracked, and I uh, I uh, I had a lot of spare time working for Cracked, and so I thought, well, I'll draw my own comic, and uh, I made up this character Lloyd Llewellyn in about 15 seconds. I literally just thought, what would be a funny name? Oh, how about a bunch of L's? Lloyd Llewellyn. Okay, <laughs> that's his personality, and I just drew him immediately. He had no real personality; he was just a guy, and I liked his glasses. And uh, and then I finished it, and I uh, I had nothing. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know who was publishing stuff at the time. I knew of Raw. I don't think I inflicted it on uh, Mr. Spiegelman, but I uh, I knew of this company, Fantagraphics, that published the Comics Journal. And I thought if I sent it to them, they would give me some feedback. Like they would call me up and say, like, you need to work on your pointers or you know your panel borders or something. And <laughs> And then many years down the road, I would be able to get my own comic, and I would mm. have learned from this. And so I got a call like a month later from Gary Groth at Fantagraphics, and he said, yeah, we'd like to give you your own monthly comic. And I was like, but, but I'm not, you know, it was sort of like, I don't want it yet. I want to, like, pay my dues and do all, you know, it's, you've just squashed my dreams in a weird way, even though you've, <laughs> you've fulfilled them. And... Uh, and but he he was very clear like it's got to be this character because everybody's got to have their character that was sort of like his <laughs> his wisdom the great wisdom of <laughs> Mr. Groth and so uh, so I believed him and I thought well okay I've got to think of more more stories with this guy with L's in his name and after three or four issues uh -huh. I was completely out of those ideas and so it sort of fizzled and. Uh, there's an, uh, an, uh, maybe this is just my imagination, my overactive imagination, but there's uh, an affection for the superhero comics of the Silver Age that runs through your work. Is it just a coincidence that there are two L's? In there, the no, uh, actually, that that was my conceit. As as hopefully very few of you know, <laughs> um, in in the old Superman comics, there was this weird obsession with double L's because yeah. his his, uh, his villain arch villain was Lex Luthor, and his girlfriend was Lana Lang, and Lois Lane was his later girl. You know, and it, it was just obvious that they loved the alliteration of the L thing, but they tried to make it almost mystical, like it was mm -hmm. you know national treasure or something. You know, one of the <laughs> and so I thought, well, the greatest Superman character would be Lloyd Llewellyn. That was literally the idea. I, yeah, I, sure. I remember seeing those panels, and every time the Superman would encounter. A, a new character that had two L's. I remember there would be a, a, a little uh, thought balloon that would of him saying, "How ironic!" That's how I, that's how I learned the the word ironic, and it was that's years I, until later, and I realized it didn't mean what I thought it meant. <laughs> I, I, I remember one. They were really stretching where it was Achilles with two L's and the Golden Fleece, and they actually put <laughs> Golden, you know, the L and those words in bold, and I was like, okay. You know. Uh, well now, or now I think we know all there is to right. know about Lloyd Llewellyn. Right. Um, so well, we could continue this, this is, subject. This is the photo from The Shining. With me. <laughs> <laughs> we could continue with this subject of your uh, uh, interest or, in the superhero comics of the Silver Age. Where are we? Who, first of all, who are you in this picture? I'm the guy with the Gumby-like hairdo in the background. <laughs> Which one? And, and the, sort of the th in the last row, third from the left. Oh, unchanged. With yeah. the uh, with a Clark Kent yeah. spit curl. <laughs> and this where was, where this, are you and why? I am what, is at this, a, what does this tell us? This was at a comic book shop in 1986, and I was trying to give the context for the world of comics that I entered as a young cartoonist, and this this is it. And I somebody found this on the Internet and sent it to me, and I, I have no recollection of it at all, but uh, it, this the look on my face is so so out of The Shining. It's just eerie. <laughs> So you were never a fanboy, or you were a fanboy? No, I was. I was. Mm -hmm. Not at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to build on that and ask you uh, an, another qu a question related f to your this affection for superhero comics and for commercial comics that you had as uh, when you were young and that informs your work. And I'd like to... The, you, not a lot of other comics who do 
uh, cartoonists who do a serious, individualistic, uh, literary graphic novels or c comics today uh, are, are willing to be so frank and open about their affection for the superhero genre. In fact, there's a lot of antagonism on the part of some more serious uh, people work in your field toward commercial comics. There are people who really who kind of revile the, that work. I'd like to ask you what you fe how you feel about that antagonism. I know you're not uh, you're not a part of it, but you're kind no, of I'm a part of it. I'm side. I'm a bit of a part of it. I, yeah. I mean, I how do you feel about it? I mean, I I was I was lucky enough to the superhero comics I read were sort of you know the very early Marvel comics like the Jack Kirby mm -hmm. comics and all the and Steve Ditko who was my favorite. Who was he? Was sort of the cracked to Kirby's Mad in a way. He was sort of the second, the second guy. But he, uh, he in particular, I thought I just loved his stuff. I still do. And but I was lucky enough to read that stuff in that. And by the time I was 15 or so, it was those guys had sort of moved on, and they, or they were doing really, you know, not their best stuff. And and it was not even second generation imitators but third and fourth generation imitators and I just totally lost interest at that point and mm -hmm. to this day I can't see the interest in anything mm -hmm. any like any of that stuff after about 1970 or so yeah. why, I mean why is that? The comics world is so bifurcated, it's so schismatic and there are very few people I think who, are, who, who walk down here from Fantastic Planet, which is what, a block Fantastic away? Fantastic Planet. No, it's like, <laughs> but it's a block away, and you're working in the same medium, and what's going on? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's the same in any field. It's like, it's a, it's a broad, it's a broad field, you know, we don't have, I've, I never understood why we have to interact with each other, and that's what I was, <laughs> that's what this photo sort of makes me think of, is that at that time we had, you know, that was where we sold our comics, was sort of in the box that said, you know, pornography in the back of the <laughs> comic store. Literally, it was always in a box. It was like, you know, do you have Lloyd the Well? And it's like, it's in the, it's in the adult <laughs> box. It's like, oh, it's, it doesn't even swear, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, eight ball. You put this slideshow together. I'm just working the buttons. Hey, man. Uh, it, why is eight ball here? Well, okay, it's forget it. Let's let's not even talk about it. <laughs> Why is April here? Well, here, here. I mean, here you. Guess come, it shouldn't be. Here you be, here you begin to come into your own, and you, uh, we now see you reaching full bloom as a, as an artist, and we're starting to see the an individualistic voice, a distinctive voice. It's not you, not you uh, uh, em emulating uh, uh, your forerunners or em even even emulating your contemporaries, but you're beginning to lead. Uh, so. What did you have in mind that you were trying to do in this work? Maybe we should talk about Well, I mean, when I started 8-Ball, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking that, I, that my career was over, basically. That when Lloyd Llewellyn ended, I just thought, that was my big chance, and mm -hmm. forget it. I'm not going to ever make a living as a cartoonist. and I'm going to have to go back to school or something. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do, I want to try to do, like, one comic where I'm doing all the stuff I really wanted to do in the first place and really... Just sort of do it for myself. Just I, I really thought it would go two or three issues, and I, I would then one day be able to look back on it. You know, I always kind of admired the. There were these underground cartoonists who would do like one issue or two issues, and I always loved those guys. You know, like who did like Hungry Chuck Biscuits was one. You know, that was, um, and you know, and then never did anything again. You know, and so I thought I want to be like.